Okay, please take your seat. We are going to start momentarily. Let's continue and let's see what we can do with what, with what we have learned so far. Now I think it's, I hope it has become clear how I enumerable does its processing. So you can remove the breakpoints and we can simplify our code a little bit. We can go back to lambda methods again. So please change your code, make it more beautiful again. Something like this. Good. Let's start our next experiment by splitting our code up into multiple lines. So if we take a look at i enum at result, the type of i result is an i enumerable of int, right? What will be the result after the where clause? An i enumerable of int. What will be the result after the select clause? An i enumerable of int. So I can write the following code. I can change the code a little bit. I can say result equals to result dot where. Next line again, result equals to result dot select. <clears throat> Will this code change the way the system processes our values? Now we, we have no longer a single link query, but we have the call to the generator method. We have the call to the where method. We have the call to the select method. So will that now change the way it processes our values? Will generate numbers be called now here in this line because the statement has been finished here? The answer is no. If you take a look at how C Sharp processes this guy. Again, <laughs> I press F10 to go through the debugger. Now it works fine. You see, if I press F11, it still doesn't enter the generate number method. If I press F11, it still doesn't enter, still doesn't enter, still doesn't enter. Only when I'm on the in statement, I'm going into the generate numbers method. That's the point. So what you should take away from this example here is that the call to a generator method, the call to a method that generates an I enumerable is never executed. Even if you split it up in multiple lines, the whole query is executed when you run through the results, when you iterate through the results. Understand what I mean? That is called query composition. You can add various lines of code here. For instance, we could say um, var even or odd. No, let's say just var even is true. And then we can say if even, then we change the result like this. So we only add this where clause if this Boolean value, this could be an input of a customer, a customer could check a checkbox or not. It's only evaluated if even is true. So we are building the whole query based on an algorithm. If even is true and we run the whole application, let's do that, we get only 0, 6, 12, 18, and so on. If we set even to false, imagine that you have built a nice UI and the user has unchecked a checkbox. If we run it with even is equals false, we get, we get much more values. You see that one? And that's the power of link. By putting these statements in different lines, we are composing the query depending on some code artifacts, depending on an if statement, a while statement, or whatever you want. Understand what I mean? That's not easy to understand. It's called query composition, or deferred execution, defer, verschieben. The execution is deferred until somebody is really interested in the results. Any question to that? That will be super important when we do queries with entity framework against the database. You will see that. Let's change this code again a little bit and let's remove the for each statement. And instead of the for each statement, I would like to introduce you to a new guy, a new link function, which is called count. Console write line result.count. 
Now I don't have any for each statement anymore. Where and why will the generator be called? In the where clause? No. Yeah? In the right line, when result.count is called, correct. It, the, the system cannot find out how many values we have if it doesn't execute the generator method. So there are link methods, in this case, for instance, count, which execute the entire query immediately. Understand what I mean? So if we take a look, if we set a breakpoint here and set a breakpoint here in the generator method and I let everything run, it will first hit the console write line. You see that? And only because inside the console write line we call the count method, generate numbers is now called repeatedly. I can run through it again and again and again and again and again and again until all the values are generated. It should be 10 values, something like this. And then the result is printed. Understand what I mean? This is the count method. Here, before the select, I will do a result equals to result.order by descending numbers. So I will sort the numbers descending absteigend before I do the select. Let's quickly check whether it works. I will change the even to true so we have less values. Let's run it. And as you can see, we get six elements. That's correct. This is the count. Question. When is the generate numbers method executed? Is it executed here? No, we have learned that. Is it executed here? No, we have learned that. Is it executed here or is it still deferred execution? Let's see. Let's set a breakpoint and run it. You see, here we are at the order by descending. And the question is, will we reach the select statement first because it is not executed yet? because I told you it's only executed when we do a count or for each or something like this, or will it be immediately executed? Let's see. It's not executed, you see? And now we are in the generate numbers. So even if you do complex operations, something like order by, it is not immediately executed. You have to understand that order by, the statement is called order by, but it doesn't really order. It is just a kind of method that you plug into a collection of things that you put together in a kind of pipeline. And only when at the very end you say, and now I need the results, the values start flowing through this pipeline. So order by is just an operator that you schedule for deferred execution but the execution happens only when somebody is interested in the results, when somebody is pulling results out of the, of the whole link pipeline. Understand what I mean? Difficult to understand, easy to understand. Let your face know whether it's clear or not. Yeah, clear? Good. If you think, hey, Mr. Stropek, that's trivial. I already got it. Believe me. You will run into mistakes. And I will remind you when we do entity framework um, in, uh, to, 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 to this lesson, because it takes a while until you really understand what that means and what the consequences are. But now I think you've got the, the basic knowledge. That's good. Good. If you don't have any further questions regarding uh, these generators and basic link operators, I think we can switch gears and go into a larger, more complex example where we take a look at various link operators and check how they work. Is that okay for you? Or do you have any further question last chance to this topic? No? Good. Let's go into a more complicated example or a more elaborate example. 
I would like to introduce you to a web page that I really like to use. Does anybody already know Mockaroo or similar web pages? No? Then please go to mockaroo.com. This is how you write it. I really like mockaroo.com because in practice you very often need test data and I get bored creating test data. And websites like Mockaroo, there are many different uh, websites that can, uh, can generate demo data, but I personally like Mockaroo. It's free. What you can essentially do, you can say, which fields do I want to have? And Mockaroo offers you a lot of different types. You see? So let's make an example, okay? Um, let's remove all the, the fields. Huh. Let's make, let's make cars, okay? Let's make an example with cars. Let's add a field. Let's say we have a car make, der Hersteller. And if we take a look at car, oh no, do we have something like makes? Car make, you see? So we can say generate different car makes. And a website like Macaroo, you can say, give me 1000 elements and then you can hit preview and it will show you a bunch of makes car makes. Nice, isn't it? Let's see, do we have models? Car models. Yeah, car model, nice. If we take a look at preview, you will see you have now the make and the model. Mockaroo is nice, isn't it? Then we can add another field. I think that's um, the car year. Car model year, that's the year when the model arrived on the market. And let's add um, a, a mock-up field, let's say number of doors. And here we can use, let's remove that, um, a random number something like this, and we can say the minimum number of doors is two, the maximum number of doors is five, and we have zero decimals. So we just get a random number. Of course, it doesn't make sense because it doesn't fit to the models, but it is kind of demo data. It is a useful demo data. And then the horsepowers, and this will be at least 50 horsepowers, and our, most, our strongest model, let's say, has 500 horsepowers, something like this. Now we can preview this stuff again. And now we have a nice piece of demo data, you see it? Of course, these values are completely random, so they don't make much sense, but granted for demo, for doing some examples, that's really useful. Next, we can select which format, which format we would like to have. We can immediately export the data into various formats, see that one? And we are going to go for JSON. You can even, um, if, you, if you sign into Mockaroo, you can even um, not export the data, but you can store this data set under a name, and then you get automatically a web API with this demo data that you can use, for instance, in your Angular project or whatever you do. Understand what I mean? So you get a web API that generates random data for you. Do you understand the usefulness of this? That's pretty useful, isn't it? Good. Nice. Um, I would like to add a last field. That's the ID. And please add the row number. And I, would put, I will put the ID at the very beginning of our data set. ID, row number, and good. If you are happy with your data set, please download the data. It will give you a JSON file. And then take this, data, uh, uh, take this JSON file, this one, and put it into your C Sharp application. Uh, I called it hello link, and I will put it exactly here. And I'll just call it data.json. So if I go into Visual Studio, I now have my data.json file. You see it here, directly in my project. This is what you should do. So remember, if you need demo data, don't, um, 
don't come up with the demo data by yourself, but use a mock-up tool like Mockaroo or other websites. Uh, most of them are for free if you just want to generate 1,000 rows. If you want to generate 10 million rows, you have to pay for it. So they have, typically they have a freemium pricing model where you can do some generation for free and some generation for money. You will see that is also pretty useful when you think of your diploma thesis or your two-year project. You can fill your UI pretty quickly. Good? Good. Now that we have some demo data, we can get rid of our of our, of our code entirely and read the, the, the data.json and deserialize it. First, we need to have um, a target where we can store these values in C sharp. So we need to create um, a class. So let's generate a class car data, something like this. And there we can generate a property, integer ID, a property, string, make, a property, string, model, a property, what is the next one? Year, a property, int, number of doors, and a property int horse powers. Just write HP. Let's do it using system text JSON. And now we need to tell the system what is the name of the property inside of our JSON file. Because the ID, uppercase letters, is not ID here in our JSON. You see it? This ID is lowercase and this is uppercase. So we need to do a JSON property name and tell it that the property in JSON is called ID, lowercase. We need to do the same for the make. Make is called car make. So the JSON property name for make is car make. I think you get the idea. I will quickly fill it out and give you a chance to write it. So the next one will be car modal, right? Car modals. I called it car modals. Uh, not sure if that was a good idea, but JSON property name. And the next one is year. How was that called? Car year. Good. And then we have a JSON property name, and this one is, I think it was number underscore, yes. Number of doors, something like this. And last but not least, I think call it HP, like horsepowers. Good. Get the idea? Difficult? No. It is possible during the written exam, which will come in a few weeks, that I give you a JSON file and tell you, parse this JSON file, read it. Understand what I mean? That's possible. So you should be familiar with what I do here. Good. Reading that JSON file is really, really simple because we can do a var file content equals to file dot, oops, file read all text and file dot read all text, good idea. Or do you suggest a different method? Come on, I get frustrated if you don't say what? Async. Correct, thank you. Exactly. Give it a string path, data.json. That's good. And what am I missing? A uh, wait. Oh, sorry. You have to write this line of code before the declaration of the class. This is necessary. 
Maybe you can remember that if we want to use a relative path to read in some data, you have to right click on the file, go to properties, copy to output directory, copy viewer. That will copy this file into the same directory where your executable lives. And therefore you can load it without specifying an absolute path. Good so far? Now let's deserialize the content. Var cars equals to JSON serializer deserialize of car data. And we pass in the file file content. You should remember these two lines. We will use them probably a lot in the next few weeks or days. JSON serializer.deserialize car data. Uh, question, have you heard in the past of a library which is called Newtonsoft JSON? When you learned about C Sharp the first time in the school? No? Newtonsoft JSON? Newtonsoft JSON is a great library. It was used for many, many years in the past. But if you now see somebody using Newtonsoft JSON, you should not use it anymore. It was the gold standard for JSON serialization and deserialization in C Sharp, but it is not anymore. Microsoft has written a new library, which is called system.text.json, and it's faster. Granted, Newtonsoft JSON has more functionality, but system text JSON is quickly catching up. And don't worry that Mr. Uh, James Newton King, who is the owner and creator of Newtonsoft JSON, is now without a job. No, he is now working for Microsoft and doing the same what he did before, but now he is a Microsoft employee. So they just hired the guy who created the best JSON parser in the world, and now, yeah, Microsoft has its own JSON parser. But it is a completely rewrite. So if you want to parse JSON in C Sharp, if it's possible, use system text JSON and not Newtonsoft JSON. Good. Now let's make a few link queries. First, print all cars with at least four doors. Var cars with at least four doors equals two. Help me, what should I write? not available. What did I do wrong? I made this mistake consciously. The mistake is here. What is the mistake here? You see it? In the JSON file, take a look at the JSON file, do we have a single car or many cars? Many cars. Is this a single car or many cars? Single car, that's a problem, right? Yeah. So what do I have to write here? Array, Array or, list. or list, exactly, or I enumerable, whatever you want. You can say array, you can say list, and of course you could also say I enumerable. I will now write car data array, that's fine. <laughs> Scroll a little bit down. You're welcome. And with that, suddenly where becomes available. Nice. So let's print the whole guy for each var car in cars with at least four doors. And here we will say console write line. Please use a template string here. 
and say the car car dot um, make model has car dot number of doors doors. Understand it? The car, whatever, has whatever doors. The important thing is the where clause here, right? Good. Let's run this guy and see what we did wrong or whether it works. Oh, yeah, looks good. Is that clear so far? I guess it is, right? What you have learned now is how easy it is to parse in a JSON file. You have learned that um, demo data generators are really useful and we have implemented a very simple link query. Now let's make it a little bit more interesting. Uh, print all cars. Um, print all Mazda cars with at least four doors. So, var Mazdas with at least four doors equals to cars dot what? Come on. Don't make it boring. Give me an idea. I can take a look where we have Mazda. You see, that's the make Mazda. Good. So what do I do? Come on. Yep. Uh, where? where? Good. Uh, car goes to... Uh, we had it here in the make. Good. I see. Okay. Okay. We, and now comes the point. What we can do, you are right, we can say and car dot number of doors e greater equal four. Yes, that's good. We got that. The point that I want to make here is that it's equally okay to do the following. Take a look at these two statements. Now I cannot zoom in, I have to do it like that. Here I have a single where clause in, with an AND condition here in the middle. Here I have two where clauses. See that one? With a single condition here. Both, is pos both are possible, choose whatever you like. The first one is slightly, only slightly more performant at least when we run it uh, against in-memory objects. When we run it against the database, it doesn't matter. Understand what I mean? Good. So let's comment this one out. Let's copy this loop. Let's go here and something like this. The Mazda car. And let's try it. And it should look at least way less data rows and looks good. Two wear classes, not a big problem, is it? Does anybody need additional time to write down the code? Yes. Yep, good. I'll wait for another second. If you want, I can check in this file. For those of you who don't follow along, if you want to have the code, I can check it in. That's not a problem. Good. Next one. Print. Make plus modal for all makes that start with M. Not that difficult. Var make plus modal with m equals to cars dot what where right i think i don't have to ask you that and what is the condition car dot make dot starts with m 
clear, isn't it? But now comes the important part. I think this is pretty clear now. I don't want to bore you, so let's go one step further. Now I can do a select, and now it, it is interesting because the input of the select take, oops, give it a second, now I have it. The input will be car data, the input will also be some kind of int, and the output will be a result. Difficult to read, but not difficult to understand. What we can write is we can write car goes to template string car dot make space car dot modal and now the result is no longer an i enumerable of car data but now it's an i enumerable of string because we are projecting the car data into a string i will zoom in a little bit so you can see it better the select clause does anybody have problems with reading this select clause is that clear? Do you get the idea that we are changing the data type here? Let's make it even more interesting for you. There are a bunch of methods where we can turn an I enumerable directly into a certain collection type. There is a to list and a toArray method. There is also a toDictionary method, but I will not go into details here. So what we can say here is we can say toList. And that will turn the result not into an i enumerable, but it will turn the result into a list of string. And the interesting thing with the list is that this list supports a method which is called foreach. And here we can just say car goes to, and now comes the interesting part, console right line. Uh, I don't want to have this stuff here in front. Whoops. This stuff here in front. And we can console right line the car, and then we do no longer need a variable. We can write everything in a single line. Get it? I'll zoom in a little bit. Now we have a filter a projection, an execution into a list and then we iterate over the list and print the result. We do no longer need a for each loop. Question? Do we need the to list in this example? We can try to get rid of it. If we remove the to list, we don't have the for each method anymore. For each is defined on lists, not on i enumerables. Why? Oh, it has a it has a deep deep technical background, and um, there are a lot of discussions in the C sharp team going on whether for each should be available on i enumerable. Um, I I have read these discussions many years before. I can't remember all of them. It's a fact. It's not there. It is pretty simple to build for each on your own. Many people have done it, but yeah, it's not available. We have to do the two list here. It is like it is. So if I comment out these few lines here and check whether our application still runs, it looks pretty good, you see? Mitsubishi, Mercedes, Mazda, Mini, Mercury, looks good. I will wait a few more moments until everybody has written down this code. Question. It does work me says what can I repeat the variable before we use the uh I removed the variable here at the beginning. See that? Ah okay. Yeah. Because for each does not return anything. For each is an action. Okay. So it, the return type of for each is void and therefore you can't assign this value to uh, a variable. Does that fix your problem? Yep. Yes, good. Question? Clear? Nice, nice, nice. Good. So we have where, we have select, we have to list, we have for each.
Next one. Display a list of the 10 most powerful cars in terms of horsepower. I want to see make plus model of the 10 most powerful cars. Let's try this query before we go into a break. So, cars dot what? This is not that trivial anymore. Max? Hmm? Is, uh, is, is there anything like max or something? Yeah, ma max is possible. Max is possible, yes. It's possible. What you can do with max is you can give in a, day a car and you can, for instance, say something like this. This will give you the maximum horsepower over all the car data. Do you think that will help you? If you know that the most powerful car has 500 whatever horsepower? Not really, no. Not really. I don't think so, but it was a good question. Now you know, you have learned that there is a max function. So let's get rid of it, but thank you for the question. You were next. Order by. Cars dot order by. Do you really want to do an order by if you want to have the most powerful cars? Yes. So you are on the right track, definitely. So there is an order by descending what? Order by descending what? Uh, see your car. Car? Okay. At that point in time, we have a list of cars sorted by the horsepowers descending. So the most powerful cars are at the beginning of the collection. Good. Next one. Yes. We could do that, but we still don't have this one. Only the top 10. Any idea? Just press dot and take a look. Maybe there is something like take. Can you remember or can you imagine what take does? There are two very important methods. It will be super important when we do database programming. One of them is called skip and one of them is called take. They are used for paging. I will describe it, okay? Skip means skip over the first n rows and continue with the n plus one row. So skip one means ignore the first row. Skip 10 means ignore the first 10 rows and start with the 11th. Take on the other hand says take the first n rows and ignore the rest. You do that, you need that for paging. Um, imagine that you are building for your two year project or for your diploma thesis um, a website where you would like to enable the customer to page through a list of customers. You want to display the first 10 customers, take 10. Then when the user says next page, you want to skip the first 10 customers and display the next. So you say skip 10, take 10. On the third page, you say skip 20, take 10. Understand what I mean? And with that, you can go one window after the other. Understand what I mean? So in our case, we can just say take 10. And the rest is what we already have here. We can do that one. Select, to list, for each. Order by horsepower descending, take the top 10, build the result, make it modal, and print the result on the screen. So the result should be a list of 10 cars. Of course, it's completely random. So in reality, these cars might not have so many horsepowers, but yeah, that's not the point. Do you understand take and order by based on this example? Yes? Good. And with that, the second hour is already over. I think we have now a, a larger break, right? Yeah. So we have 15 minutes break. We will continue at 10. 
And then we will go even deeper and take a look at things like group by and so on. Okay? Good. Enjoy the break. <laughs>